Good morning. Wasn't that great seeing three people get baptized this morning? Such great stories. It's a really great truth. I feel like they've preached my sermon for me. That was great. Three people who have heard and responded to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And we're currently in a series all about that good news. We're asking, what is the news? And why is it good? In Paul's letter to the Romans that we find in our Bible, he gives perhaps the fullest explanation of this gospel, of what it is and why it is such good news. In it, we see the wonderful things that God has done and is doing and will do for everyone who believes. We're spending six Sundays exploring different aspects of the gospel. And the hope is this that you who already believe will encounter Jesus afresh each week and be filled with confidence that the gospel really is the best news for you and everyone you know. And secondly, we hope that those of you who are looking in, maybe exploring Christianity or maybe you're, you're here with friends who are part of this church, our hope is that you might see, perhaps for the first time, that Jesus and what he has done is life-changing news for you too. At the start of chapter 5 of his letter to the Romans, Paul writes this beautiful short summary of the gospel. He says that since we have been justified, that means made right with God, through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Because of Jesus and what he's done, believers have, past tense, been made right with God. And now, present tense, we have peace with God. More than that, we get to stand in his grace, and we have a future hope as well, that we will be with him in glory for all of eternity. The gospel deals with our past, our present, and our future. That is the big picture for all who believe. But today I want to zoom in. We're going to home in on just one word that I hope you noticed in the passage. Grace. Paul says that through Jesus we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Grace is a word that appears 23 times in the book of Romans alone, and it's a theme we find right the way through the Old and the New Testaments. Grace is the undeserved favor and kindness of God. The undeserved favor and kindness of God given as a gift. And today we're going to look at why we all need this grace, how it really is an undeserved gift. And then we're going to look at the wonderful truth of what it means to receive that grace and what it looks like for you to stand in the grace of God. And we're going to do this by looking at a picture that Paul paints in Romans 5. It might seem a strange picture to some of you at first. As we look at it together, I hope it's going to bring home to you the wonder and the beauty of God's grace for you. So let's look at the picture Paul paints. You can follow along on the screen. Romans 5, starting at verse 12. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned even to those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. 
For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gospel of grace today. We've been hearing about it already. We want to have more understanding of it this morning, but, but Lord, don't let us just leave here with information only. We want to meet with you right now. And I, I want to ask that you would speak to us through your word, that you would allow us to experience your grace in these next few minutes by the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you give us ears to hear you, give us soft hearts to hear what you want to say to us this morning, Lord. Amen. So in the passage we read, Paul introduced two characters. You might have heard of them. Adam and Jesus. And we're part of this story too, because every one of us, indeed all people, are either in Adam or in Jesus Christ. Paul's claim here is that there is no middle ground. You either belong to Team Adam or Team Jesus. Let's look first at Adam, because it's in Adam that we find our desperate need for God's grace. Adam was the first human being created to be God's representative in the good world that God had created. Adam was made to know God and enjoy him forever, but instead, Adam chose to reach out and grasp authority on his own terms. It was a rebellion against God, and in Genesis 3, we learn that it brought death into the world. After all, when you choose to cut yourself off from the source, the giver of all life, you choose death. Through Adam, Paul says in verse 12, that death spread to all. Because all sinned, you and I have responsibility for how we've lived. And there's not a person in this room who hasn't followed in Adam's footsteps. We want to do things our own way. We want to be in charge. We, we want to set our own course. We want to be self-reliant. And although it breaks his heart, God gives us exactly what we want. He hands us over to the destructive consequences of our own choice, death. But it's about more than just individual mistakes or choices here and there. This is actually our state of being. In this passage in Romans 5, Paul shows us just how deep the problem runs. You see, as the first human, Adam represented the entire human race. As the father, he set the pattern for all his children. Because of Adam's sin, every human being that comes after him is affected. This idea of being in Adam, and therefore being kind of attached to his rebellion might seem a strange concept for some of us, particularly those of us who've grown up in the West with our overdeveloped sense of self-determination and individualism. But really, it's not such a strange concept. We even see it at work in science. Every one of you has DNA received from your parents that essentially pre-programs you to certain characteristics. Height, build, skin color, hair color, athletic ability, we could go on. There might be strengths, and there will certainly be weaknesses that you've simply inherited. And those things profoundly affect your experience of life, whether you like it or not. 
It's as though Paul is saying that because you're in Adam, you've got his DNA. It pre-programs you to fall short. Romans 3.23 says, All have fallen short of the glory of God. And you can't escape that on your own. You're powerless to work your way out. No self-improvement program is going to cut it. Even your best attempts at righteousness are stained with pride. You're part of a human race in a mess that's headed for death. So in Adam, we all become sinners. Through his disobedience, we became disobedient. We all came under condemnation, and we were all as good as dead, as long as we remained in Adam. You ready for the good news? (laughs) You see, just at the right time, while we were still weak and powerless, chained to Adam, unable to do a thing about it, Jesus died for the ungodly. That's you and me. It's hard to imagine anyone willingly dying for someone else, right? Maybe somebody might, you know, might be able to just about understand somebody dying for somebody who's particularly good, particularly noble in their character, but God loves you so much that he sent his own son to die for you in your place, while you were still a rebel, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us because of his grace, because of his undeserved favor and kindness towards us. Jesus gave us a way out, a way out of Adam and in to Christ. To be in grace is to be in Christ. So what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, Jesus lived the perfect life. He was entirely righteous. He fulfilled the law completely. He was always obedient to God all the way to the cross. And just as everyone in Adam was chained to Adam's failure and brokenness, so now in Christ all the blessings that he earned, all his righteousness, are given to you as a free gift. When you take that step of faith to receive the grace of God in Christ, you exchange death for life. Jesus said in John 10 that he came to give abundant life to us, not just life to the full in the here and now, but eternal life with him forever. Later in Romans, Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Adam, we earn according to our sin. We get exactly what we deserve, but in Christ, we get what we do not deserve. By his grace, he gives us life, In Christ, you exchange being an enemy of God for being a friend of God. You exchange condemnation for justification. We're forgiven. It's often said that justification means it's just as if I had never sinned. I would add it's also just as if you had always obeyed because Jesus always obeyed and you are in him now. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. In Christ, you're united with him. You are joined permanently to him so that his relationship with the Father is now your relationship with the Father. The Apostle John, we heard this verse earlier, the Apostle John writes that we are called children of God because that is what we are. And if children, then heirs to a glorious inheritance. In Christ, you receive his spirit who pours the love of God into your hearts. Not that you might just know it, but that you might actually experience it. And in Christ, the grace of God gives you power to live a glorious purpose, live a life of glorious purpose with and for God. You are not powerless anymore like you were in Adam. You are in Christ, a new creation. You have new Christ-like DNA. Sin once controlled you. You couldn't escape it, but not anymore. 
You are free. And you're allowed to be excited about it. <laughs> How much did you contribute to any of that? Nothing at all. It's a gift. All you have to do is, all you have to do to receive it is admit that you come empty-handed and in need. You simply need to turn to the giver and ask. So let's get a bit more practical now. What does all this mean for your daily Christian life? Getting up in the morning and going about your day. Well, Paul says that we must stand in grace. The Christian life is standing in grace today and tomorrow and the next day and every day after that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you became a Christian by walking through a door of grace, but now you're through and it's all a bit different. Now you've really got to you know, step up. You've got to prove your credentials. Otherwise, be out the door again. This isn't a promotion to a position that you've now got to live up to. This is a rebirth. You died in Adam, and now you're born again in Christ. That's what's symbolized in those baptisms that we saw. You go down into the water as though buried, dead, and you get raised back up again into this new life. If you're a believer, think for a moment about when you became a Christian. And maybe you were really young, maybe it was just a few minutes ago. All those mind-blowing blessings in Christ were given to you right there and then. So away you go, you receive God's grace, you get baptized, and you're fired up to live this new holy life set apart for God, worthy of your calling. Here we go. But what happens if, or more realistically, when, you make a mess of things? Well, let's say you don't even make a full-on mess of things, which you will. What if you just forget to read your Bible for a few days, or or you, you pray and you just get so distracted, and maybe you see an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, and you just chicken out, don't say anything. What happens when that familiar voice of condemnation just creeps back in? I thought you were a Christian. Aren't you meant to be better at this? What's the antidote to that? How do we overcome that condemnation? Is it to agree with the voice of accusation? Because after all, he has a point. Do you just need to resolve that you really must do better, work harder, so that you can work your way back to that that good place with God where you started? No, 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 no. The answer is to remind yourself where you stand because of grace. It is to boldly approach God's throne of grace once again, not cringing, waiting to be hit, with your arms stretched wide, running towards him like a, like a kid running towards a loving parent. Lots of Christians go through life just feeling like their relationship with God fluctuates. It depends on how they're performing, you know, how much they're praying or reading the Bible or serving the poor or pick any number of things. One obvious problem with that is that it means that your relationship with God depends on you, rather than being dependent on God's glorious grace that he has given you freely. If everything you have is a gift from God, what could you possibly add to make yourself any more worthy of him? We must never try to impress God. We are in Christ if you are in Christ. He has already impressed him quite enough. We must never try to overcome that feeling of unworthiness 
by sanctification, by doing lots of things. Don't hear me wrong in this. Sanctification is wonderful. Sanctification is the ongoing work of God in our lives that transforms us day by day, makes us more and more like Jesus. It is amazing, but sanctification isn't what makes you acceptable to God. We become completely and totally acceptable to God the moment that we receive his free gift of righteousness. I love reading the Bible. You hear us bang on about it from up here all of the time. It's so good for you. But we don't read the Bible to improve our standing with God. Praying's wonderful, but you can't pray to impress God. We pray because we love speaking to our Heavenly Father and because we get to ask Him for things as His children. Now, relying totally on the grace of God might seem like a risky business. To put all your weight on what Jesus has given you, you might be tempted, you know, to hedge your bets, just top things up a bit by, uh, in your own efforts, you know, what can you do? Just, just make sure you're over that line. But Paul's letter to the Galatians is all about what a bad idea that is. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. I do not nullify the grace of God, Paul says, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. In fact, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You've fallen away from grace. Strong stuff. We mustn't deny grace by trying to improve our standing with God based on our own works. There's loads we could say about how it is grace that in fact empowers us to do good works and to live life for God. That is true. But honestly, if your natural instinct is to rush on from the free gift of grace, to focus on what you can do for God, then I just want to caution you to pause. Make sure you have this foundation settled. Allow the full extent of God's outrageous grace for you to sink in to every part of you. Because if, if that is not your foundation then every other Christian teaching, how we live, what we're to do with our lives, it'll all be useless to you. The gospel is good news, not good advice. It's not primarily about what you do. It's what, about what he has done for you. It's a gift we must receive. Are you getting this message yet? Now, I know living in grace can be especially hard if, if you have perfectionist tendencies. I struggle a little bit with that. I, I hate getting things wrong. I'm always acutely aware of just, like, how much better I should be doing that stuff. So I find myself open to feeling like God might be disappointed with me and my shortcomings. Maybe some of you can relate to that. But God told me years ago that the perfectionist tendency in me was God-given. Sure, it got pretty warped and twisted. He told me that he put in that, cert, that desire, that longing for perfection in my heart. My search for perfection wasn't futile. It just wasn't going to be found in me. Not yet, in a way. The search for perfection finds its fulfillment in Jesus, in who he is, and, and what he has done. You can't, you can't improve on Jesus' perfection. You can only enjoy it and celebrate it and thank God for it and live in the good of it. In short, you can worship. Jesus is perfect. And Colossians 3, 3 says that if you're a follower of Jesus, your life 
is hidden in him. That means that when God looks at you, he sees all of Christ's perfection. I just want to address something on that, because I think it tripped me up for years. That word, hidden. It might suggest that any minute now, you're going to be discovered <laughs> and cast out. If you're worried you're going to get found out, God wants you to know this morning that you didn't sneak into his grace. You're not in Christ by some accident. God himself put you there. He took you out of Adam and he rooted you securely into Christ. And he was delighted to do it. He doesn't give his grace begrudgingly. He loves to lavish it on you because he loves you. And now nothing can separate you from that love. Finally, I, want, I just feel God wants to impress on every one of us the power of his grace. When the power of death in Adam and the power of life in Christ go head to head, there's no competition. Our passage in Romans 5 stresses over and over again that Christ's triumph outweighs Adam's sin every single time, no matter who you are or what you've done. The righteousness of Christ is far greater than the unrighteousness of Adam. The obedience of Christ is far more powerful and superior to the, the disobedience of Adam. For those who are in Christ, in his grace, there's no going back. Death has no hold, and sin has no power anymore. So how should we respond to all of this? Maybe the band could come back up and join me. Firstly, I, I want to appeal to you. If you know that you're still in Adam, that you're still trying to make this whole thing work on your own and in your own strength, this might be the first time you've ever been in a church, or you might have been around for years, but today you've realized that you have been relying on yourself and what you can do to make yourself right with God. Or maybe today you've just realized just how bleak where you are, where you find yourself in Adam, outside of Christ, is. You don't need to remain there. Turn to Jesus today. Receive his grace for you. He loves you so much. He always has done. He died for you while you still had your back turned to him. So turn around. Turn around and receive the gift of grace. You can leave your old life behind. Your old life in Adam, you can leave it behind today. You can be in Christ today. You can walk out of here in Christ. All you need to do is put your faith in Jesus. Trust that he died in your place. He took the punishment that you deserved. And in return, he'll give you undeserved favor and kindness forever and ever and ever. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray this along with me. Why don't we all just close our eyes now? If you know you're in Adam, I want, I want to appeal to you to, to pray this with me in your heart. God hears. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I need you. I come empty handed today. I want to receive your free gift. I want to step into your grace. I want you to take me out of Adam and put me in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me so that I could enjoy all the blessings of Christ, so that I could enjoy life 
so I could know forgiveness, so that I could be united with Jesus. Amen. And if you're already a Christian, I want to ask you today, are you standing in grace? Or have you fallen back into the trap of trying to impress God? Are you succumbing to condemnation that Jesus has already freed you from? Jesus has done it. He fulfilled every law, and on the cross he said, It is finished. So don't move on from grace. Stand in it. Keep standing in it. Enjoy his grace. Celebrate his grace. We're going to spend some time singing about it in a moment. But I'd love you to stand. Let's just come before God now. You might want to close your eyes just to help you focus on the giver of grace right now. I'm going to read one final scripture. And I want to read it over you. I want to encourage you just to ask the Holy Spirit now just to, to speak to you through it and to apply it deep within your heart. It's from Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast.